my name is Christy Kirby, and I'll be your host today. Um, our latest installment of the Coros Fireside Chats, uh, where we feature digital marketing, uh, digital marketers who are innovating in the customer engagement space. Um, we'll be joined today by Julie Goo Scalen, Director of Audience Development for Haggerty, an automotive enthusiast brand. Uh, Julie has agreed to share her wisdom with us for what brands can do better to connect with their audiences. Thanks again for being with us today, Julie. Hi, Christy. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, great chat with you. Um, a reminder for everyone that we'll have a live Q&A with Julie in about 20 minutes. So please feel free to drop in any questions you have in that Q&A panel and we'll address those at the end. And with that, let's get started. Uh, so as the product marketing lead for the Coros Marketing Solution, we spend a lot of times uh, looking at the market. And Julie, today we see that marketers are really pivoting their brand presence to focus on building trust and providing authentic connection to their communities. Um, we'd love to hear how is Haggerty embracing this trend? Definitely. I think that, you know, like many global brands, I think that Haggerty sees a greater purpose in our products and services beyond just the utility of the car insurance that we provide. So at our core, not only do we want to keep you on the road, but we want to save, um, save driving for generations to come. That's why we call our customers enthusiasts. And we you know, do that deliberately because it's all about the fundamental passion a person has for the automobile, you know, regardless of whether they own one or not. That recognition, that fellow thumbs up um, is what really builds that trust and affinity for our brand. And we want to do that regardless of what channel or platform or what relationship you have with us. Wow. So, you know, tell us a little bit more, you know, about, about Haggerty. If, if, if you are trying to, you know, save the, the mission of, of driving, um, how does that play out at Haggerty? How does it affect um, your content strategy or the, the channels you adopt, your audiences? Um, it's, it sounds like a very noble and big mission. <laughs> Well, I think what's great about that is first off, it really unburdens us from the hard sell, right? We're not actively trying to sell you insurance. That is going to, that's, that's just a given, but what instead it allows us to do is it allows us to embrace that community of enthusiasts who may or not, may not ever spend money with us. So our fundamental principles really um, are one, we want to engage with people where they are. Two, we want to prioritize engagement over conversion. And three, we want to foster user-generated content because that's how you kind of grow beyond yourself. So three, three big principles there. Can you unpack those a little bit for us? Yeah, definitely. So I think when we talk about engaging people where they are, that means that it really gives us the freedom to say no just as well as what platforms we do choose to be on. So we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. We're even on Pinterest uh, for you know, obvious reasons being that cars are great to look at, but TikTok is awesome. It's fun. I love the dances. I love the memes, but that's not where enthusiasts are and we're not going to be on TikTok anytime soon. Um, secondly, I think, you know, when we talk about prioritizing engagement over conversion, what that really means to us, it's about playing the long game. Engagement takes time to build. It's not something that happens instantaneously. You know, these days, nothing really necessarily goes viral, not even a Kim Kardashian cat video is guaranteed to do that. So it has to be habit forming in terms of our content. So when we have new content ideas, we let them run for at least one to three months. We give them time and opportunity to develop, and then we look at the overall engagement rate, not just one specific metric. So it's not always just about clicks or views or shares or comments, but overall, how many people saw it and then did they take an action? And, and that last one on fostering user engagement, what, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think that really talks about going beyond ourselves. So when I say going beyond ourselves is what value are we providing be beyond the products and services that we're trying to monetize? So for us, it's about forming a community where we are bringing car enthusiasts together to meet one another, and we're providing them a platform and a place to give them a voice to how they can discuss their passion for automobiles, whether that's on our new community, Haggerty Community Powered by Coros, or whether that's on um, you know, our owned and operated channels on our website or on other social media platforms. It's really about creating a, you know, providing a service for a need through our business. And, you know, that is also going to help collectively save driving. You know, if we can empower people to continue to talk about their passion, share that passion with others, um, it really kind of creates that brand longevity that we're looking for. 
Yeah. So, so taking such a thoughtful and coordinated approach, making sure that all the channels that you're adopting make sense for your audience and for that mission of, you know, let's save driving. Um, thinking about, you know, your purview and, and coordinating all these efforts across all these different um, digital channels, but both, you know, owned communities and, and social communities and such. Um, how do you use that for your advantage when it comes to content production or even just editorial planning? I think we always start by asking a question or we ask the question, right? Or so what do we want to know of our audience? Where are we trying to get out of them? What, what does engagement or success look like? So sometimes that's literally asking the question. Um, we find that anytime we ask a direct audience a uh, question of our audience, it tends to lead to more engagement. It tends to lead to more ideas. Um, you know, things kind of beget other things. So, you know, for example, when a few weeks ago we, Every week we ask a community questions. So it'd be like, you know, do you prefer Mustangs versus Camaros, whatever. So it's just a fun, lighthearted way, nothing hard hitting, just to kind of get people to engage. And so we asked the question, what are your favorite cars named after animals? Kind of harmless, right? Which thought it'd be a fun thing. It yeah. blew up. It was something that I think everybody from the amateur enthusiast to the diehard, you know, person who has 50 cars in their collection was able to chime in on. So we received hundreds of comments over the day on that one post. And then what we did is we tallied up our favorites or the ones that had the most mentions. We created an article um, or a listicle um, based on those uh, that feedback. And then from there, that listicle got more promotion and more engagement. We did it on, we then promoted the listicle on social. And then we, at the end of the day, then repurposed all that amazing content into a live stream. So we didn't intend for that to necessarily happen. It was, it was just because, you know, we got into this habit of always asking the question and sometimes you just hit on the right note and then you take advantage of that opportunity in the moment to just continue to grow and to, you know, serve the audience and base, basically give them more of what they're asking for. Yeah, that's such a smart approach by, you know, pulling on sort of a, a thread that your mm -hmm. community responds to and then you're thinking about what's all the different ways we can redisplay this or use this and and obviously it sounds like you're being very thoughtful about taking that initial conversation and and tailoring it depending on the channel that you you want to share it on. Um, but I can imagine that that, you know, isn't always an embraced philosophy by lots of brands like the ability to see something on one channel and and sort of spread it like wildfire. So how do you make sure that this approach of sort of taking these nuggets from what your community is giving you and sharing it, how, how are you making sure that approach and philosophy is, is embraced by your team? How do you help your team feel confident to engage with audiences in this really you know, thoughtful, natural way and, and have authentic connection? I think for us, it is about primarily about removing the fear and replacing that with empowerment. So when I say removing the fear, it's, it's fear of missing out. Like we've all had experiences of FOMO. It's fear of making a mistake. It's fear of speaking out of turn. You know, as digital marketers, particularly in this day and age, we have to be quick. We have to be agile. We have to be ready to respond at any moment when the audience's expectations are like, I posted, how come you haven't responded to me? It's been three seconds. Um, <laughs> And I can't do that on my own. I'm only one person. I've got an amazing team behind me. And I think part of why we gel so well, work so well together is because we all know at the end of the day that we have to be flexible. And part of that flexibility means that sometimes mistakes are going to happen or unintended things are going to happen. So how do we make sure that we pivot from those when they do, which they inevitably will. And we do that by also making sure that we're honoring our audience, right? We're owning up to, yep, there was a typo. Sorry, we totally knew that that was supposed to be 69 Mustang and we said 68, but you got us and we're, we've made that correction and we appreciate it. You know, so just being transparent and direct and having that dialogue. I mean, that's also an opportunity to have a conversation with your audience in that direct way when sometimes something like that happens. So it's really about, you know, making sure that everybody from my team, who are the people doing the posting, to my boss, who's looking at the posting, to our audience knows that mistakes can happen and that's okay. Nobody has to be afraid of that. Yeah, so if, if brands, you know, are, are needing to be more human, I think it's okay to admit that we are human and we, we all make mistakes and, and, and embracing that and not trying to cover it up and, mm -hmm. and treating it with a lighthearted manner and, and also, you know, rolling down that philosophy to your entire team. That, that's great. And, and I definitely think having that sort of 
um, above and below you support and everyone on, on the same page with understanding that mistakes are going to happen and we're going to roll with the punches. Like, that's great. And I think that's why we've seen Haggerty be so successful with this, this human connection um, drive to your audiences. Um, yeah, and it maintains that authenticity that we're so well known for, right? People know that there's a real human at the other end of the line, whether you call us, whether you tweet at us, whether you, e you email us, there's a real person looking at it. None of us are bots, I promise. <laughs> you know, so when we think about, you know, all this is great and good, where the, the shift toward being more, more human, but, you know, what does effective marketing look like, you know, in particularly in 2020? How do you build those win-win relationships with your audience? So it's great to be altruistic, but how are you also making sure that you're you're being effective as a marketer? Definitely. I mean, don't get me wrong. We are still all about selling insurance, all about selling our membership, making sure that we are supporting more and more automotive enthusiasts with our products. Um, so we look at audience building in a few different ways. Um, we we look at what we are pushing out in terms of content. We look at how we are responding to the people that we engage with um, on our owned properties and um, accounts. And then lastly, I think this is the part that sometimes many people forget about is how we also engage with other brands on their on their pages at their level on their home base because we can't do this alone. So not only can we not do this alone with a, without an audience, but also without other people helping us, right? We're not the car manufacturers. We're the, we're the insurance company that's providing the insurance. So we've got to be friendly with the car manufacturers and make sure that there's, they continue to make the cars that our people are so passionate about too. So can you tell us a bit more about that first one? So um, how you think about the type of content that you're pushing out? So first and foremost, we, we need to make sure that it has intrinsic value that isn't just about selling somebody something, that there's value, whether it's to inform or to entertain or uh, to delight in some way. So it's not a hard sell at all. And we need to make sure that all of our content kind of surrounds like what is going to be the most engaging piece of content where they don't have to do anything, but just consume it. Yeah. And your, your second audience approach was a bit on um, how, how you respond to the folks who are engaging with you. Yes. So you can't forget, you know, as you're pushing stuff out there, the more you push stuff out there, the, the better that it's well received, the more people are going to engage and then they expect a response back as well. So people, you can't just respond to only the negative comments or the complaints. You've also got to respond to the positive comments too, to provide that validation, to provide that reminder. Hey, like we, we see you, we're here. Um, thank you so much for writing with us. Um, so we need to make sure that we are timely. We always do same day responses um, that we are human. We always use names. So mm -hmm. I'm Julie. Hi, Christy. Thanks so much for telling us about your Camaro. And we are genuine, right? We mirror other people's feedback. So if they ask a question, we make sure that we say the question in our response. It's like a very simple psychological technique, but it really does make people feel like, oh, they heard me because they just repeated the question back to me even. Yeah. yeah. And and I liked your kind of third point, which is a bit more provocative, I think, for lots of brands on how you engage other brands. So, you know, how does how does Haggerty tackle that? Yeah, I think that we think about it as we're we're all kind of one team automotive, right? And we want to make sure that we're all supporting this community of car enthusiasts. So we look at brands that we either that either inspire us or that we aspire to be like. So, you know, I think everybody wants to be more like Apple these days. So we want to make sure that we're engaging with their thought leadership, that we start dialogue um, with, you know, um, some of their executives on like a LinkedIn platform, for example. So that's another way to build your brands. It's not a hard sell with your products and services, but it's also showcasing your thought leadership, your strategy, the direction of your executives. And then, you know, on the other side, what are brands that kind of we aspire or inspire us to be like, for example, you know, REI's latest campaign about kind of camping and off-roading. Well, that's an easy segue for us, right? When we have the new Bronco, for example, and all of its off-road capabilities. So if they're talking about their camping gear, well, what's a perfect complement to REI's camping gear? It has to be the new Ford Bronco. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, then we can talk about the legacy and history of the Bronco. So easy ways to kind of tap in to things that are adjacent in some ways to our core demographic and our core services, but still very relevant. Yeah, no, that, that's a very smart approach. And when I'm thinking about the, the way you're approaching, you know, your mission, how that, you know, portrays in the channels you're adopting, the way you're creating content and distributing it. Um, I would love, it sounds like a lot of these are very like organic and natural things that you're connecting to, but would, would love to hear about your approach to um, 
you know, is this organic only efforts or is it paid as well? How do you sort of plan um, promoted and organic content and, and how does that, how does that work at Haggerty? Yeah, so I think we definitely take a test and learn approach in the sense that uh, nothing is off the table. Any uh, one of my team members is open to always test anything on any of the channels that they own. And then we sleep on it, meaning that we give it 24 hours to, to have a life of its own, to live and breathe and see what the response is. And if the response is not that great, then like mental note, let's see how we can tweak it to, incur and to you know, increase the engagement. Or if it does really well, like the animal car thing, then what are other ways that we can continue to leverage it, get more juice out of that lemon, if you will. But also on top of that, what are there easy, similar ways that we can kind of adopt that same sort of direction? So that's kind of on the organic side of it. Um, and we also you know, need to make sure that we're match following that engagement rate so that we do have core demographic benchmarks that we can kind of point our executives back to because we know our stuff day in and day out. But at the very high level, when they've got two minutes of time and you, they just need to digest two pieces of data, that's an easy one to say. We've increased our engagement by three points. Great. Makes sense. Awesome. Great job. Um, I think from a pay perspective, Everybody does paid and that is okay. It is not like some horrible, filthy, dirty, dark secret. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're not doing your job well. It doesn't mean that, you know, if, if your brand can't live purely on organic, then you're failing. Paid is just a necessary way, I think, of this, you know, internet machine that we all kind of live and breathe in right now. But it means that you can also be smart with your approach and you can make it work to your advantage. So we always start small, one to two week flights you know, $1,000 budgets, nothing crazy um, with limited variables. So, you know, we, we kind of have some core demographic audiences that and interest-based audiences that we test um, that are kind of always like our baseline. And then from there, if certain things peak, then, you know, we, we start to iterate from there. So if we do a story and we do a boost, boosted post and we see that it's really resonating with 45 and up, then in the next round, we only target 45 and up. Just little bite-sized pieces like that can make a difference. You don't have to go full in, you know, with a fully integrated, you know, six-figure, three-month campaign. And, 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 and I find that when you do that, it's almost like a set it and forget it type of thing. And then you feel like at the end of it, like, what have you actually learned? You're not sure. Yeah, taking that much more active approach to be, you know, let the content sort of, like your, your, the way you phrase it, that it has a life of its own, like see what's working and what doesn't and then amplify a little and then if it's still going, you know, turn up the gas. So I think mm -hmm. that's a very thoughtful approach in letting, you know, organic sort of lead the way for what you need to be promoting. Um, so very thoughtful approach. Um, you know, again, when I think about uh, us at Koros and, and watching the market and seeing that, you know, so many brands are, are again, trying to figure out what channels to be on, how to be more efficient with what they're posting, how to be more authentic. Um, it sounds like Haggerty is doing so much right. And I, I imagine you've got to have a treasure trove of advice that you could share. Um, so for, for other digital marketers who are looking for ways, how do they adopt a more agile approach to audience engagement or if they need to incorporate more audience insights into what they're doing or if they need to make a huge channel pivot, you know, what, what are some practical tips that, that you think really serve you well um, with your role at Haggerty? Oh yeah, there's so much, but um, if I could narrow it down, I would say a few things. Okay, one, pick, pick your one key metric. For us, it's engagement rate. For you, it might be clicks, or it might be unique visitors, or it might be email signups. Whatever is going to resonate with your executives, that is easily trackable on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Make that your one key metric that you're always going to be benchmarking against and tracking on a post by post level, on a channel by channel level, platform by platform level. Think about that and just make that that one thing that you look at every single day and the one thing that you consistently report on, because that's going to help you also create that story and that narrative for what's working well and what's not. Um, secondly, you know, kind of follow a 70-30 rule roughly. Um, what I mean by that is about 70% of your content should be planned. Right. You, you kind of know there's certain milestones that are happening in your industry. There's some product launches or services that you're going to be promoting or campaigns. So you can kind of plan that out one to two weeks, even a month in advance. But leave yourself some flexibility. Give, you, give yourself that 30% where that day, 30% of your posts are unplanned, and then you can kind of 
had the flexibility to be spontaneous, to touch on pop culture memes that might be relevant to you. You know, you might forget that today is National Donut Day and then you might remember that morning and now you have the flexibility because you haven't overpromised all of your various other business stakeholders that you would promote their event or that you would do this. So now you can actually do a post about Donut Day, um, that type of thing. So kind of give yourself a little bit of leeway to, to have a little of independence and fun. Um, and then lastly, it's really just about engaging your, with your audience and that moderation is key. So when I talk about moderation, it's, it's timeliness, it's response, it's having a dialogue with that person rather than just, you know, going through rapid fire and liking every single comment that you ever received. Um, that doesn't feel authentic either. So make sure that you're engaging with that dialogue and then leverage it as a time to gather their feedback too. You know, not everything has to be, um, an NPS survey. Um, it can just be a quick like, hey, thanks so much for giving this a thumbs up. What did you really like about this the most? And then if they don't respond, no problem. Maybe somebody else sees that comment, they respond in kind instead. Um, and then lastly, just like be helpful. You know, if, at the end of the day, like we're not going to get your business. We're still going to try to help you answer your question about your Camaro or your Mustang. Um, obviously, I'm a Mustang Camaro fan because I keep using those examples. But um, yeah, I would say that those are kind of maybe the three most important takeaways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Julie, thanks again for sharing, um, you know, the, your point of view on how marketers can be more agile, what's working for you at Haggerty, letting us learn a little bit more about how an insurance brand is really focused on um, saving the art of driving, which is super noble. Um, we would love to, uh, to help uh, or to now dive into our question and answer session uh, for our fireside chat. So we're going to uh, tee up the questions that are in the Q&A. And if anyone on the line wants to chime in with any more, now's a great time. Um, but for our first question, um, how does what you do as a marketer really integrate with customer service? That, um, that is definitely a growing need of ours. I mean, we, you know, have an amazing call center um, and service center and they get anywhere from 7,000 to 10,000 calls a day. And so part of our job, I think, as our audiences become more digitally savvy, as they come to realize that they can get their same customer service needs met on um, a, you know, a Facebook private message or a Twitter comment is that we need to work hand in hand with the service center. So we need to make sure that we have the set processes in place and the people so we know when to escalate an issue if it's about an existing claim um, or an existing piece of business, when we can respond, when we feel confident enough to do that, and then kind of everything in between, right? And we also want to help people. We also want to teach people like self-service. So if somebody is asking like, oh, how do I reset my password? Not only do we want to maybe just give them the shortcut and do the reset for them, but then we also want to provide the instructions of like, an FYI, if this ever happens again, this is how it would happen. So having that process and really working closely with our key stakeholders in the service center is really, really important. And, and making sure they understand that we're not here, we're only here to aid them and we're not here to, you know, take their calls away and that type of thing. Yeah, I think that's, you know, at the end of the day, the folks engaging with you on whether it's social media or own media or digital media or phone call, they just see, you know, Haggerty and they want to have one consistent exactly. engagement. So I think it's, it's great that, you know, that you're taking such a thoughtful approach with, you know, if it needs to be handed off to customer service, you know, um, keeping that, that process and, and um, that, that touch of, you know, customer service and everything you do, even on a marketing point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how, so a question around measurement. Um, so how do you know, uh, your, oh, how do you know you're successful beyond the metrics? Um, so, so what goes beyond just, you know, the KPIs that you're tracking? Um, what does success mean for, for Haggerty? I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's the qualitative stuff that's a little bit harder to quantify, but I think it's, you know, being at an automotive event where people are organically mentioning Haggerty. Um, seeing your magazine um, at the random doctor's office visit that you have. It is also um, having, you know, noticing that the comments that are coming through, the quality of the comments, the type of comments, um, how they're engaging, um, you know, getting a sense of whether the audience is, is in on the joke or not. 
Um, I know that's like so hard to quantify, but it is like having that that tactile feel. And that comes with the fact that, you know, we have a team of of moderators who are actively reading and reviewing every single comment. So we really do have that, I, I think, like direct connection with our audience. And that allows us to give us, you know, to give our executives those like qu quick, nice little sound bites and snack snackable anecdotes that just kind of help show that social media, I think in, sometimes in large companies, especially companies that are um, in more kind of traditional like finance, insurance, those types of industries, I think that sometimes they um, either feel like social is a necessary evil or, um, you know, something to be like very, very conservative on because God forbid, like, you know, do you want to have a, a, a bad tweet Connie situation? Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are valid fears and challenges, but I think at the same time, if you can use anecdotes from real audiences, um, real comments and case studies to educate your executives about the fact that, yes, um, you can have bad case scenarios, but you've got to trust that your team can handle it because we're moderating everything. And two, then you can also have these like really great gems, right? Like for example, we realized that, um, our customers are starting to pivot more to 80s and 90s cars. And we realized that through the comments that we got on any time we posted an 80s or 90s car, it would get more engagement than if we posted, you know, a, a different era car. Mm -hmm. And we provided that feedback back to the, the insurance or back to our insurance counterparts. And now we have a larger appetite to insure 80s and 90s cars. And we're actively marketing for them because we're following some of those trends. So, you know, also thinking about it in that sense, where are those anecdotes that you can feed back to other places in the business mm -hmm. um, where they're not hearing that feedback anywhere else? Yeah, so using social as like a focus group to help steer the business. Absolutely. You know, that may be something that's not a KPI of, of social or, or digital marketing, but something that I, you know, I'm sure your your groups who who manage the portfolio are really excited to to have that nugget delivered, um, so they could pivot and hopefully have a really profitable new line of business. Yeah. Uh, well, I know we're we're right at at 11:30, so. Um, I appreciate everyone's time who, who joined today. Julie, again, thank you so much for joining and, and I really appreciate you, you being here. The, the recording for this will be live and, and posted uh, shortly in, in I believe a couple of days on Atlas, but thanks again for your time, Julie, and, and hope you have a great rest of your week. Yeah, thanks everybody. If you guys have other questions or just wanna reach out directly, you can find me on Instagram at Julie Goo.